All right, thank you. All right. Um, first of all, uh, again, um, last week we had our um, nonprofit come in to uh, discuss requirements for the course. I have posted some documents out there today for those of you that are online, uh, which are probably the documents that he handed out in class, but you can take a look anyhow because I'm not really sure what he handed out in class. Um, I, I would encourage you all to try it. I, I heard some concern about the difficulty of it. Uh, keep in mind that, that uh, again, we're talking about an organization that has no website at all and one that, you know, uh, some of you folks, uh, I imagine, are going to offer to develop them for free. So whatever you come up with, I'm sure they're going to be very appreciative of, and it can be a basis on which it can be built upon and, and grow. So don't look at it as though it has to be, you know, something massive and something perfect. Get them moving in the right direction. Incremental growth. Um, there, there, there really is, uh, and there has been two sort of philosophies about software development uh, over time, and. One of them is what they call the waterfall approach, and that is where you have phases um, that typically take a long time, and just like water going down a waterfall, once it starts, it moves to completion, all right? Um, the other style is, is what's called an iterative approach, and that is, uh, I think, uh, the style that, that, that has gained more favor recently. Whereas you don't look to hit a home run and, and develop some giant application that's perfect right from the word go. Instead, you capture some important features and you're constantly in a mode of looking at what you did and continuously improving it. All right? Rather than trying to design and create something that's perfect right from the bat. That's very difficult to do. All right, and people have observed that in terms of developing software, that's hard to do, to envision something and, and design it and, and create it and test it and have a perfect end product. That's very difficult to do. Uh, a much better approach is the, the, the notion of, of a cycle and sort of a spiral where you're spiraling in on your goal and, and at each pass you're getting a little closer to your goal and you're making it a little better, a little better, a little better. And that, that's sort of the, the approach that we should take. This is the very first pass that, that they're taking for this website. So therefore, um, just get them off to a good start. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Get them off to a good start. Get them in the right direction. Again, they don't have anything, so therefore, whatever you do will be good. Um, I do encourage you to, 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 to try this option. Again, you know, it would be a great addition to your resume to be able to say, I did this. Um, and then we can go from there. All right, yes. Have I thought about letting uh, you work together? I'm very reluctant to do that. Uh, for one reason, um, I, you know, frankly, I don't see it as a couple person job. I see it as a, a one person job. I, yeah, I don't see it as a, a you know, if I were to allow folks to work together, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, how do I want to say this? I guess I would expect something spectacular then. You know what I mean? I think you might be better off working on it uh, individually and um, then have more modest expectations on my part. <laughs> Uh, that's probably the best way to say it. I do encourage you to, um, if not work together officially, to bounce ideas off of each other and, and show each other what you've done and, and ask for suggestions and get feedback. But I, ask, uh, you know, I encourage all of you to do that, you know, regardless of whether you're doing the nonprofit option or not. So in that regard, don't, don't think that you're, you're set out here uh, alone uh, set to the to the wolves and and you know you you have to face this alone we can uh, we can work with you and and your your fellow classmates can work with you to to give you some assistance other questions or comments time for the design is coming quick i don't remember the exact date it's due but it strikes me as approximately 2 weeks from now april 4th 
that sounds about right, which would be about two weeks, yeah. So uh, again, you, you, you want to you want to keep on it and, and keep moving. Um, I would suggest you bring your stuff to class slash lab, you know, on a thumb drive or whatever. Because again, uh, it's possible we could have some time in class or, or during lab to brainstorm, look at things, and so on. All right, here's a plan for uh, today and in probably the rest of this week and, and probably some into next week. First off, we're going to polish off accessibility. We sort of talked about it last time. I'm sorry, not last time, but a, a week from today, a week ago uh, today. And then we had our visitor that, that discussed uh, the nonprofit option on Thursday. So we're going to finish that up with some, with some final thoughts. We had a, you know, in my mind, we had a really good discussion of accessibility um, on that Tuesday. And I just sort of want to give some final thoughts and maybe talk about some resources and uh, uh, et cetera. After that, we'll go into HTML tables and what to use them for and what not to use them for. All right, on accessibility. Um, the bottom line, uh, l l let, me, let me try to summarize and, and wrap up this topic with a couple of thoughts. <coughs> First of all, how do people with disabilities access the web? All right. Um, they're able to do so through a combination of two things. Assistive technology plus what I would say the principles of universal design. Those things taken together sort of uh, do it and, and I guess the other thing I would say is um, a handful of special accommoda accommodations. And we'll talk about these in a second. Again, we defined assistive technology last time as anything hardware or software that assists people uh, that have disabilities. A, a screen magnifier, a on-screen keyboard, a screen reader, a braille tablet, any of those things are forms of assistive technology. All right? They're hardware and, and or software that, that help people access the site. Universal design is a notion that we are going to design um, for everyone and keeping in mind that what benefits people that are disabled often benefits other people as well. All right? Um, closely associated with this is the notion that really every disability, the obstacles that are posed by it, um, come a, come, comes across, uh, th those same obstacles happen to other people who don't necessarily have that disability. That is, for example, a deaf person can't hear the audio of a, of a video, uh, of a clip. But then again, maybe someone that is in a busy computer lab can't hear it as well. Or maybe someone who's a little bit older has a harder time hearing it. All right? Um, and so on. Um, likewise, you know, um, people that are dyslexic uh, don't handle a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, clutter and and gratuitous animation, all right? But then again, neither do busy people because busy people want to find what they're interested in without having to wade through a mess of stuff. So that is, is universal design. I guess what we're going to add to that then is there's a handful of things that we do just for people that are disabled that really have limited or no value to people that can see. We'll, we'll talk about some of those. But really, those are actually just a handful of things. These, you know, most of accessibility is addressed through assistive technology plus universal design. The, the sad truth is, though, that this assistive technology can be defeated if these things are not taken into account. So a person can have a screen reader, but if someone doesn't, the web developer doesn't include all the attributes in the images, then it's useless. Um, if someone 
makes all their links simply be the words click here, right? You know, click here for information about JavaScript. If the words click here are the link, that's going to be useless to someone navigating the screen through a screen reader because as they navigate and tab through the links, the screen reader is simply going to be saying click here, click here, click here, click here, and not going to give any sense of what, what, what it is that they're clicking on. <laughs> All right. Um, universal design or universal usability has two main aspects. First of which is clarity. Yeah, I know. Clarity. Thanks for letting me know, though. Clarity. If I were to, I asked you at some point to pick out sites that were um, good sites and sites that were bad sites. Almost invariably, the sites that people pick out are bad are sites that aren't too simple, but are too complicated. All right? almost, almost invariably, when I ask people to pick a site that they uh, don't like, it's a site that's very cluttered, it's a site where the navigation isn't clear, it's a site where so much is going on that um, it's difficult to, to find where you are. You know, one of the most common complaints you hear about a website is I can't find what I'm looking for on this site. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for, that's almost the same as it not being there at all, right? Um, and I've heard web developers that don't really get it tell me, you know, when, when I've brought up these things, oh, that's on our site, that's on our site. Well, yeah, but if you can't find it, or if it's difficult to find, then it's, it's, it's pretty much useless whether it's on your site or not. So clarity. Very rarely do you hear people say, this is a bad site because it's too simple. It's too easy to find the stuff that I'm looking for. All right. Uh, my attention is on the most important stuff, and there's not a lot of stuff to distract me. You, know, you just don't hear people say those things. All right. I suppose it would be possible to make a site that was just so thin on content that it was literally just too simple, and there wasn't enough there. But you know what? That's not the mistake most web developers make. It's just like it's probably possible to be too obsessed with exercising and proper diet, right? But that's not the mistake that most people need to be worried about, right? That's not the problem that most people need to address. So it's the same idea with web development. Um, and therefore, strive for clarity. And clarity comes in a variety of forms. Clarity comes in for, uh, the form of making sure you pick a font that's easy to read. Make sure your color combinations uh, are very clear. Make sure the language you use is clear. Make sure that your language is clear and someone can scan your text and find what they're looking for. You know, avoid large words or complicated sentences because people read screens differently. I always love the, I always love the 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 proverb something like, "Never use a." big word when a diminutive one will suffice. All right. Uh, so write it simple. And that doesn't mean dumbing it down. Right? I, I, I want to clear that. We're not, we're not trying to dumb down the content on the page. We're trying to be clear for it. There's a lot of great quotes about uh, simplicity. Uh, one very famous one from Einstein who says something to the effect of things need to be as simple as they can be, but no simpler. That is, we don't want to dumb down our content. We want to present it as clearly and as simply as possible, but not dumb it down. There, there's, uh, there's another one, again, by the jazz musician Charles Mingus, who says something of the effect of, anyone can take something and make it complicated. It takes a real genius to take something and make it simple. All right? So we want to we wanna use those things sort of as our model to, to look for clarity and look for simplicity. So clarity in terms of physically how it looks. Clarity in terms of the language. Clarity in terms of the navigation. Not just clear what the links are, although that is obviously a consideration, but clarity as far as how you've divided up your content. You've divided up your content in a way that's going to be clear to the people that are visiting your site. 
One common mistake I see website developers do is they break their site down and structure it the same way that their organization is structured. Well, guess what? No one in the outside world knows how your organization is structured. So the structure of the organization may make perfect sense for you, but someone from the outside doesn't know anything about it. Therefore, it needs to be clear from their perspective. That's one of the reasons we create these personas, is so that we can try to put ourselves in the mindsets of these people that are visiting your site and trying to find something they're looking for. Okay, so clarity is number one issue, uh, or is one of the two big issues. The other issue is multiple presentations. Multiple presentations. Multiple presentations. Why do I have a board, or, or whatever you call this thing, to write on and to write the words multiple presentation at the same time I'm saying the words multiple presentation? Exactly. So there's more than one way for people to get the information. Now think about it. That will benefit someone with, uh, it could potentially benefit someone with disabilities. For example, if someone was deaf, they could read that. If someone didn't have good eyesight, they could hear my voice. In addition, there's all sorts of talks about, uh, talk about when you educate people, involving more senses can help educate them better. All right? For example, um, you know, w when you teach little kids to add, usually what you do is you actually give them things. You know? I have two pens. And I add a third pen to it. What do I have? Well, they're hearing you. You might write it on, on the board, two plus one, and they can actually touch and involve that sense as well. So the more senses that you can evolve, the more um, your, your, your message will have an impact, and your, the more that you can reach people and, and educate them or convince them or whatever your message is, get it across to them. So that's one of the reasons for multiple presentations. The other reason, as I stated before, is if people have different disabilities, then one of the ways will touch them probably better than the other. In addition, if someone has a specific learning style by presenting it multiple ways, that, that will touch them more. Um, multiple presentation takes on a lot of different forms, including images along with text. That's a form of multiple presentation. You know, if I have a picture of a horse and I have the word horse underneath it, I've presented that information a couple of different ways. If I have a video clip of how a horse gallops along with a little animation, I've presented it different ways. All right? So there's that obvious sort of multimedia way of doing it. But there's other ways too that maybe are a little more subtle. For example, let's say I have on my page a warning message about something, you know. I, 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 you know, I sell over-the-counter cold remedies and I want to give a warning that says, you know, don't take more than two of these a day or something like that, all right? Now, if I put my warning message in red text, that's good, right? That'll set it out for people. That is, that will set it out for people that can see and are not colorblind, all right? Therefore, what would be another way I could present that same information? Okay, maybe, maybe use a different shade that I could be sure that people with color blinds, although that's a little dicey. But, yeah, maybe make it red and a bigger font, all right? So yeah, the color choice would have an impact, but I guess what I'm getting at is in addition to changing the color, do something else with it, all right? So change the color and make a bigger font. Change the color and make a different font. Change the color and make it bold, all right? For people that can catch both ways of presenting it, you've just doubly emphasized it, no big deal. They really get the message that this is a warning message. But for people that um, can't see uh, uh, the, the difference in the color, they still get the message that this is somehow different. 
Remember, it's human nature that when we see something, if we see text that looks the same, we assume it's like the same sort of thing. Whereas if text looks different, we assume there's something different about it. So if there was one sentence in a paragraph that was bigger font in red, automatically our brain knows, hey, there's something different about it. And if it's bigger and if it's emphasized, we know that that's probably more important than the rest of the text. All right? Other things we can do, you know, we can put background colors on things. We can set things out to the side. We can put borders around them. All those typographical things that we talked about and all those things that we talked about as far as CSS styling goes aren't merely to make our pages look pretty. They're to give additional visual cues to our viewers about the content of our site, the way the site's structured, and what's important. So we can say something's important by saying this is important, but we can also highlight it in some way to really uh, emphasize that fact. All right. So that's what I mean by multiple presentations. All right. Um, now, in a way, in a way, if you've been listening closely, you might accuse me of talking out of both sides of my mouth, as they say. Right? On one hand, I'm saying clarity. Keep it simple. Keep it pared down. Keep it straightforward. And I then take a breath, and in the next breath I say, use multiple presentations. Take the same information and show it a couple different ways. Well, isn't that the opposite of clarity? In a way it is, right? In a way it is. However, that really, you know, to, to, you know, to, to use the old cliche, that's why we get the big bucks, right? Striking a balance between simplicity and multiple presentations and content really is the art of web design, all right? Figuring out how I can take this topic and organize it in a straightforward way and present it so that I'm being very informative, but still keeping it simple. That really is the art. Striking a balance between those two, two uh, forces that are moving in apparently contradictory uh, directions. So, for example, our horse galloping. You know, we could have a video of it, we could have animation of it, and we could have a photo of it, and we could have an audio recording of it, and we could have a paragraph describing it. Well, that sounds like overkill, right? Your job would be to find out what the best way to illustrate that. Yes? On the video, though, you can say audio and video. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, the video, yeah, the, yeah, video would include audio as well. Yeah, good point. I guess the point is, is we have a bunch of different ways we could present that information. We would want to find the way that we felt find the way or ways that we felt best communicated. Now, the thing is though, it's not a case of, gee, if two ways of pre presenting this information is good, then ten ways will be even better, right? Doesn't work that way. That's where you have to go and you have, just like, you know, if, if, if two aspirin are good, then five aspirin will be really good. No, it doesn't work that way. All right, doesn't work that way. And it's the same thing with web design. All right, um, you have to strike that balance between the simplicity and um, giving a rich experience and giving a, a multi-dimensional and multimedia and and uh, um, multiple presentation view uh, of a topic. Now that being said, there are again a couple of things that are pretty much specific to. Uh, that, that are accommodations that, for the most part, are strictly speaking for um, people that are disabled. When we talk about tables, the code that's going to make those, 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 those tables accessible, really, for the most part, don't do anything for people that aren't accessing the page with a screen reader. All right? But it, at least it doesn't hurt. All right? So it's kind of like having Braille outside the doors here. All right? Yeah. That doesn't do me any good. That doesn't help me at all. All right. But you know what? I may not even notice that it's there. So it's not like it gets in my way of finding this room. All right. 
And it's sort of the same thing for some of the other uh, things that we put in. I do want to investigate and look at a couple of different resources that I have posted to Angel. So let me pull those up. That's the wrong semester. Spring 2011. Um, here's a PowerPoint that I did. And again, um, I'm not big on PowerPoint, so I didn't give it in this class. But it, it does make good reading to review it. It sort of summarizes this. This is a great resource, especially the sections on forms and tables. Um, when we talk about forms and tables, um, that's one of the reasons why this is a good time to talk about accessibility, because there are some definite accessibility issues with regards to forms and tables. And, and we'll talk about those. There's a nice little pre and post test to read as well. Someone was asking about access keys, how you could use keys. Uh, and again, this is this is an explanation on how you can use access keys. All right. This is a W3C's view on accessibility. When we get into forms, this would be a good one. Here's an online accessibility test that cannot be displayed. All right. Wonder if there's an issue with that site. Um, here is a online screen reader. All right. Wow. Tough day for these sites. Here is a color blindness test. All right. So we can, for example, go and we'll put up a site. Um, let's think of a site that we might want to view. I want to view a, a, a site that doesn't have tons of, of stuff. Um, Anyone have an idea of a good site to view? Let's try Flickr. Yeah, there's Flickr. Now, I can go in and I can say I want to view that site. And I can say I can apply different filters to it. What is uh, what are these different filters correspond to? These different filters correspond to different degrees and different kinds of colorblindness. In other words, it's not like people that are colorblind see the world in black and white. People that are colorblind have different sort of uh, um, issues with that. In other words, this one can't tell the difference between red and green. This particular kind of that. So let's pull up this and let's see what it says. This sometimes takes a while.
didn't seem to work pretty well. Repeat that, please. Oh, how'd that go? Well, we'll try that one next if this one doesn't go good. All right. This shows us what, again, the W3C site looks like with a colorblind filter. Let's pull it up in the, with, with a specific colorblind filter of red-green colorblindness. All right. Notice that's how the logo looks. All right. Here, I think I disabled CSS. So therefore, um, the CSS looks a little bit different. But notice how it filtered that image. It shows me how that image looks. That's how it would look with someone that has red, green color blindness, as opposed to that. All right. So this is a nice uh, tool that you can use to sort of uh, uh, filter that out and, and test it if you don't um, know anyone that has those particular ailments. All right, I would encourage you to read through the PowerPoint presentation. Um, oops. Are there any questions on this? Do pay attention because in the next couple of sections when we talk about forms and tables, one of the things that we will talk about is we will talk about accessibility. One thing that a lot of people do um, is when they create their forms and tables, they don't apply the accessibility guidelines that, that I discuss in class. So uh, please pay attention as I go over those and, and, uh, and you'll be okay. All right. Question about accessibility. I want to at least start tables today. And I want to start tables by giving you a brief history lesson. All right. Back in the old days, when the web was first created, once upon a time, when the web was first created, the web was created for scientists. All right, Tim Berners-Lee at the Center for Nuclear Research over in, in CERN uh, developed the World Wide Web as a way of linking together academic papers. So instead of a footnote that simply said, you know, Jones said such and such in his paper, you would have a hyperlink to it. So you could click on it and actually see Jones's paper. That was, at the time, that was a radical notion, you know. And, and the funny thing is, is this is all within our lifetime, right? This isn't like something, you know, I'm not describing something in the 1700s that they developed, right? This is, you know, you know in, the, in the 80s, I'd say, maybe early 90s. I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head. At any rate, all right, so the first version of the web really was more or less about that, being able to link text documents together. Well, as is often the case, when, you know, in, in, our, uh, in our capitalistic economic system, when there's a good idea, the next thing that happens is people start to think how they can make money off of it, right? And therefore, the web was seen as a forum for businesses to be able to use it, the web commercially. And, and they may not have known exactly how they were going to do it, but they looked at the potential and said, wow, this is great. We have to figure out a way to make some money off of this, all right, in a nutshell. Therefore, the web became a place for, uh, to market your business. All right, you, you would set up a website that talked about your business and, and people could visit it and view your products and do all sorts of great things. The problem is, is where scientists aren't terribly concerned about the way things look, you know, scientists, the, the stereotype of a scientist is that they would be more interested in content than image or appearance. Um, you know, think of Einstein with his wild hair, right? Um, People in business and marketing um, would, at the very least, value both of them. All right. Uh, I, I suppose, depending on how cynical you are, you could say that they value appearance more than content, but they, at least they pay attention to the way things look. So therefore, when people develop marketing brochures, they spend a lot of time making them look right. And the early versions of the web weren't very well suited for that. All right, because. They didn't simply want a document. They wanted to have 
what like websites look like now. You know, little areas where there were headlines and links and that sort of thing. All right. At the time, there was no CSS. Right. So someone got the idea. Let's use a tag called the table tag. And let's take it and if we twist the usage of it, we can twist a table so that we can make a nice little grid on our page and put our stuff in it. And therefore we can line stuff up. What do I mean by a table? I mean like a grid like you'd have in Excel where you have rows and columns, rows and columns of, of stuff. All right. Well, if we look at our standard web page, you know, the sort of real straightforward simple web design, we could view it as a big giant table that has two rows and two columns. And then we can put our logo here, we can put our banner here, we can put our links here, and we can put our content here. And that was pretty good. And the marketing people could get pages that look like the way they wanted them to look instead of just like a dry, boring, from top to bottom academic paper. All right. Remember, there was no CSS at the time. Later, when CSS was introduced, it took a long time for CSS to work right. They really had to work out the bugs and the kinks and everything in CSS and the browsers to where CSS became effective. Now, if you're working in an environment and you're trying to develop a site that looks a certain way, you can go to your boss and say, I know how to do it. We're going to use CSS. We just got to wait four or five years for them to get all the bugs kicked, you know, knocked out of the browsers and the CSS specification, and then we'll have a beautiful website. Your boss isn't going to hear any word that you say after, you know, after the first few. They're going to say, Okay, that's great, but I need it done by the end of the week, right? Something along those lines. So therefore, web developers still continue to use tables to control the layout of the page. Well, let's fast forward till now. Now CSS is widespread, and CSS is effective, and the bugs for the most part have been worked out of it. Depending on when and where you took your first web development, if this is the first web development class that you've had, then we've sort of taught the, the correct way using CSS. But some of you may have used, uh, may have done some web development before, both people here in class and people in uh, the online class. This reflects sort of the old way of doing websites. And we don't ever want to go back to coding this way again. All right. The reason is because that design really unnecessarily limits you. All right. We can't really change the way the page looks after we've divided into that grid. Yeah, we might be able to play around a little bit with the, the, the size of the columns and the size of the rows and all that. But if we develop our pages this way, we're pretty much stuck with having our code in a two by two grid. Well, what happens if you want to then display that page on a cell phone and you don't want a two by two grid, you just want one column? Or what happens if you decide that you want it to look a different way? You're locked into that and you can't change it without massive amounts of effort. So therefore, any of you in the past that use tables for layouts, don't do it anymore. I definitely will deduct if I see a table used for layout. All your layout should be used, should, should be accomplished using CSS. So, if tables are so bad, all right, why are we even talking about them? Why wouldn't I just say don't use tables and be done with this? Well, the reason for that is tables themselves aren't bad. It's just that they've been misused in the past. All right. There's a perfectly legitimate use for tables, and tables still should be used for this legitimate use. And the legitimate use for tables is when you want to show a table of data. That is when you want to show a set of data that has rows and columns. 
For example, you know, uh, temperature, average temperature in, in the United States, right? You could do something like that. You could have the rows representing the different cities. So Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, Elyria, New York. And then maybe the columns represent the month. You know, the average temperature for January, February, March, and so on down the line. For that kind of data, tables are the way to go because that's a table of data. It's the kind of data that you would have in an Excel worksheet. All right? So for that, tables are, are perfectly well suited. All right? So that's why we're covering uh, tables. Another way to say this is even though tables have been misused in the past, tables are not deprecated. Okay? Deprecated is a good word um, to make sure that we know the meaning of. Any idea what, what the word deprecated means? It doesn't sound good, right? If someone were to come in today and tell me I was deprecated, I probably wouldn't sound happy, right? What does deprecated mean, though, actually mean? Disparaged. Disparaged would be a good synonym, yes. Going away, Going away or obsolete as well. In other words, some tags are deprecated. What deprecated means is there's a better way to do this and you should never ever do it this old way, but for the time being we're keeping it in the language because there's still some old stuff out there. For example, the font tag. All right? That's another one that if you learned web development a while ago you might have used. All right? The font tag is deprecated. Why? Because there's no occasion on which it's a good idea to use a font tag. Never, ever, ever use a font tag. It's not a good idea. Don't, never, ever. Not even once. All right? Don't even think about it. Yeah. it you know, it, 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 it's, it's like, like I tell my kids, you know, don't even think about doing that, you know. Of course, by saying that, that forces them to think about doing it, but that, that's another question. What? Oh yeah, it would work because there are probably some old sites out there that that's, that still have them, and you don't want to, and the browser developers don't want to break those sites. However, there could be at some point where they say, you know what, we're not supporting that anymore, and it could break. All right, tables on the other hand aren't deprecated because there still is a perfectly legitimate use for tables. We just want to make sure that we don't misuse them and, and take the tables and use them for some other use. So. Let me show you why we need the table tag. The reason we need the table tag is because of the way HTML handles white space. So let's go in and let's make let's make a page and I'll remove the style and I'll try to do just what I did what I wrote on the board now if I do this I don't know what's the average in Atlanta for January. We'll make these numbers up. All right. What happens if we view this HTML page? Come on now, you heard me type and you know exactly what I put in there. <laughs> what happens if we view this HTML page? What's it going to look like? 
it's going to be one line, right? Because even though I thought I laid it out as a table, how does HTML treat the white space? Well, it, it disregards the white space. And therefore, if I went and saved this and viewed it as predicted, The browser's laughing at my code because it knows what I knows what I was trying to do and knows it's not going to work. All right. What if I and now you might say to yourself, okay, well, what if I did this? I can put a break tag on the end. I could do that. Well, I'm still not there, right? I have to space out those. Well, I thought I did. Well, we could use a non-breaking space, the, the pound sign MBSP to give more space. You know what? That's a nightmare. And if um, even if you get it to work, that's assuming with your fonts. If you try it on another browser, you have a mess. That's what you need a table tag for, to define the specific rows and columns that you want. So let's go and let's put this in a table tag. Uh, we're going to talk about um, four tags today. We have a couple minutes left. We should be able to finish this up. And the first one is the table tag, which is very simple. It simply goes around our whole table. So we have a start table tag and an end table tag. Sure. The question was, could you give the tables an ID? Absolutely. So if we wanted to style a specific table a specific way, absolutely. We'll get into that either, either next time or, or next week. Yep. Any HTML element you can give an ID or a class to. We then have a TR tag, which stands for table rows. So I am just going to do a couple of rows. I'm not going to really be concerned with getting it perfect. And again, we have our start and end tag. And then table rows contain either THs or TDs. THs stand for table headings. TDs stand for table data. So I could do something like this. City. And do January. February. And March. And then that's the head table headings, that's the column headings. And we can then go in and put the table data. So like I did the first city was Atlanta and I'll just do a row's worth of temperatures, 50, table tag that goes around the whole table, a TR for each row, and then within the, the, the TR, either THs for table headings or TDs for table data. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In addition, we can style. Uh, we, we can do a lot of the things with style. For example, you know, you could consider Atlanta as sort of a heading as well a column heading. And then we'll look more about how to, how to style that next time. Then if we go and save this and view it, that's how it looks. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have a border default, but there's all kinds of things that we can do with style. And, and we'll do those next time. All right. I'll put this example up and then we'll, we'll definitely build on this one next time. All right, see you over in Lamb.